What was it like walking into the House of Commons for the first time? Oh, daunting. I, I mean, I, I went from a, a local courtroom, and I had, you know, appeared in other courtrooms. But it, to me, it felt like the biggest courtroom in the world. Welcome back to the Northern Sentinels podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ayotte. I hit the beautiful roads of Nova Scotia to meet up with my next guest, a proud resident of Pictou County, He comes from a family with a multitude of professional backgrounds that influenced him at a young age. After completing his law degree in Halifax, he worked a diverse array of legal cases, which is where he developed his desire to improve victims' rights in Canada. Although he had no interest in getting into politics, being fired from one job might just have landed him in the House of Commons. After a few years learning the ropes in Ottawa, he became leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. A merger with the Reform Party set the conditions for his tenure as Ministers of Foreign Affairs, National Defense, and Justice. His time in defense was noteworthy for many reasons, not the least of which being his entire tenure in the portfolio was during the Afghan War. After leaving politics, he found his way home to Nova Scotia and his love for family and practicing the law. Listeners, my conversation with Peter McKay. Thank you so much for being uh, being on the podcast and inviting me into uh, to your home. I mean, spectacular views and uh, in beautiful Nova Scotia here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Chris, and welcome. It's uh, it's nice to have company. When we were talking previously, I mean, how far from where you grew up is uh, are you right now? It's about twenty minutes. Uh, we're uh, we're on the on the shore here, at King's Head, but um, my dad still lives on the original settlement, uh, a farm. A uh, little little community called Lorn, where there's more cows than people. And has has this always been sort of the McKay family's uh, area um, in Pictou County? Are we in Pictou County? We're in Pictou right? County. Yeah, yeah, Pictou County has been the the ancestral home. Uh, I'm the fifth generation. Uh, we had relatives, obviously, who came here, settled here from Scotland, and. Um, were millers. They they worked in the woods. My grandfather, I recall, uh, you know, running a sawmill and just the, the hustle and bustle of uh, of that. It almost seems surreal when I think back on it. It seems like such a bygone era that it couldn't have been in my lifetime. But um, you know, seventies and eighties, that mill was a going concern. And uh, we, you know, you know, when I say a farm, we had cattle and geese and a few animals. But really, the family business was was forestry. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a great point. I mean, I I think we tend to get lost in the uh, in our in our everyday. But when you think back in your lifetime of when what your grandparents were doing when you were young, and and what that industry looks like now, and, and a variety of industries uh, that are on that industrial age, it is kind of shocking. It's a bit of ground rush, isn't it? It, it is, and it's very humbling too. Uh, when I think of my own father who's 87 and what he saw in his lifetime and then I I was very close to my grandfather but to think that you know he was born in the 1800s and you know grew up through the depression Uh, what he saw in terms of the advancement of technology and the change just in our little community you know let alone the 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 big broad world it is uh, it's a rush to think that so much has happened that I, I have some relativity to. Mm-hmm. Now, my kids, I, I think, may see that as well, uh, just in terms of what we're seeing now with artificial intelligence and just the, the incredible information age that we live in, for better or worse. Um, I think in some ways, kids grow up much faster. Certainly, they, my kids are exposed to far more than I ever was at their age. Well, they're, yeah, they're certainly sponges, and yes. when you have, you know, the sum total of most of uh, most of the knowledge of humanity in the palm of your hand, I mean, it, uh, you can certainly grow up in certain ways a lot faster than I think we ever we ever did. Well, it's jarring, Chris, because for better or worse, um, you know, when you think about the educational spectrum and the possibilities that it opens up to have that access. <clears throat> 
But there's a very dark side of that too. Mm. And, you know, I, I spent a good part of my career working in the criminal justice system, saw some pretty bad things, even in this little community, working as a crown prosecutor and as a defense counsel. And then, you know, fast forward to sort of the end of my political uh, career where I was at the Department of Justice. And I sometimes hearken back to those experiences relative to raising my kids and, and not sheltering them, but wanting to protect them in ways so that they can just be kids, hmm. which, again, I, I think it, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of in this fast-paced world. But kids need time to be kids, and they need time to figure things out for themselves and, and to play, you know, whether it's music or sport or just with their friends. I'm very uneasy with the, the screen time, and we struggle with that <laughs> yeah. as parents, you know, in, yeah. in terms of how much is enough. What was your childhood like growing up here? What were the things that you remember fondly about being a, a child in, in sort of rural Canada? To me, it's almost out of another era that, that couldn't be real. It's, it was like a, a rerun of Little House on the Prairie that I watched as opposed to what I'd actually lived. But, I mean, I went to a one-room school, kind of the last of that era, just before they started busing kids. Lived with my parents across the street from my grandparents on this farm. Very idyllic, you know, coasting. Uh, on the hills around home, um, fishing in the brooks, making hay in the summer. We had a big vegetable garden. All of those things um, were a big part of, of my childhood and, uh, and caring for animals and, you know, those little life lessons. We planted a lot of trees in that time. And I remember funnily thinking back on it that, you know, people were saying to my grandfather, well, why are you planting trees? We're never going to run out of trees. Sort of like we're never going to run out of fish in the ocean. Right. Yeah. You know, so that's a bit of a touchstone when you think about forestry today and uh, the, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions and all of those considerations. But as a child, I was poor, probably more naive than most because we lived in such a small little community. My world was... You know, going to school, walking to school. I mean, just to put it in some context, we had we had a couple of kids that came to school on horseback, tied their horses outside the school. There was no running water. We had a pump in the, in the school to to draw water from a well, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, a, a two hole washroom outside yeah. that got tipped over every Halloween. <laughs> I was telling my son about that the other day. So it was, uh, you know, it, it does harken back to a, a much different era. In many ways, but I am I am so thankful for that childhood. It uh, I think really grounded me, and I, I still have friends that I went to that one room schoolhouse with. There was probably about sixty of us from grade primary to grade six. What uh, what did your parents do? So my mother was an Irish immigrant. Came here with her her parents. Her dad uh, was a commander in the British Navy. And saw action in both wars, was a cadet in World War I with really? the RN, and uh, then was deemed redundant, as the Navy did in those days after the war, and just went to work for Western Union, so continued a, a career at sea. In fact, was involved in the laying of the first transatlantic cable from Ireland to Newfoundland. And then re-enlisted merchant navy in world war ii and he had spent so much time in halifax with the convoys and uh, with the navy and ironically he met his wife who was also irish in halifax she was from a very wealthy family who'd been sent here to get away from the war okay and he was in the navy and they met at a garden party in uh in halifax and that began this incredible relationship and uh survived the war, obviously. And then after World War II, he'd spent so much time on this side that he said, I want to retire here. And he became a blueberry farmer in the Annapolis Valley. So my grandmother and and uh, their two daughters came to Nova Scotia. And she spent uh, her formative years in the Annapolis Valley on this blueberry farm. So my parents met while they were studying at Acadia University. My dad um, 
did a law degree at Dow. My mother was a home economist at, uh, when she graduated from Acadia, I think in 1960. And um, they got married. They, my dad's roots were here in Pictou County, so they, they moved here. Um, I have uh, three sisters and a brother. And, you know, we, uh, we grew up on this little farm. My parents, unfortunately, separated when I was uh, about eight. And that sort of put us on different paths in some ways in terms of, uh, you know, what, what my father and grandfather would have experienced on this little farm. I always came back here every summer, but my mom decided she wanted to be closer to her parents in the valley, back in the Annapolis Valley. And, you know, I followed both of their footsteps to Acadia University, as did three of my sisters. And so, but here we are back in, in Pictou County, so clearly you had a, uh, a pretty deep connection to, to this part of Nova Scotia then. Yeah, I did for sure. And um, that was, and, and with great respect for my dad, he, he was off doing his career, which took him to Ottawa and all over the country. So I spent a, a, a disproportionate amount of my time as a kid with my grandparents uh, when I wasn't with my mom in the valley, I was here, and I, I grew up on that farm. But you know, my friends were in town in Stellarton, and I played baseball and hockey, and sort of established a lot of close connections to Pictou County. And so I had a kind of a, a foot in both camps in the in the Annapolis Valley, but but here in Pictou County. And so when I finished university, it seemed like a natural place for me to come and, and start a career. Now you talked about your your grandparents, um, grandfather being in the Royal Navy. And did you have, or was there a sense of service uh, as a child growing up? Or was that something that sort of came to you later in life? And there, obviously your father's political career as well. Yeah, there, there was that sense of public service and, and, and a calling in a way. I certainly saw it with my, my father, although maybe more from a distance. My mother was influential in many ways because of her own uh, activism. She was involved in women's health movement. Um, she, she was a counselor, um, a psychologist, so she worked a lot with international students at Acadia University. And she volunteered. She was always involved in, in community activities. And so I, I, I grew up in that environment seeing my parents doing things that were, you know, much larger than their own careers, much larger than, than thinking about themselves only. And so I, I admired that. And my grandfather, who was in the Navy, I didn't really hear as much about that until, you know, I was in university, and then I took an interest in, in his career and what he had done. Um, and I thought, I thought I would join the military at one point. In, in university at Dal, I, uh, I tried to join the Navy. Uh, I wanted to go into the JAG unit um, mm -hmm. as Judge Advocate General, sort of as counsel, and they had a freeze on hiring. Uh, at that time. <laughs> yeah. And so it sort of got delayed. I filled out all of the paperwork. And then, you know, after I finished school, I was in uh, the attorney general's department at that point. Then I got a call saying, hey, we could receive you now. And <laughs> I'd kind of launched. And uh, I often think back, though, Chris, as to how my career might have gone in a completely different direction. Life's all about timing, Peter, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. Everything is about timing. You talked about your grandfather, maybe you being a little more interested in his uh, his service. Like my, my grandfather was in the Second World War, and he really didn't talk about it much. Was it something that you, you had to sort of proactively dig out of him? Because that's what I found with my, uh, with my grandfather. Absolutely. And unfortunately, he, he died when I was still quite young. And so a lot of it was vicarious and came through my mother and my grandmother talking about his career. But, you know, I often heard them remark that he he basically didn't want to talk about it. He, in fact, 
one of the reasons that, I, that it was explained that he went into farming is he said, I never want to be on the water again. I mean, you can imagine coming through the Battle of the Atlantic and transiting the ocean as much as he did. He said, and, and they'd been torpedoed. He was at Jutland. He, he was at some of the, the big battles and uh, he never talked about it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, like modern veterans, it was very traumatizing and people dealt with it differently then as now there was far less support it was far less what you would consider counseling and trying to help people cope with post-traumatic stress i work with an organization now on the board of wounded warriors and uh, i've seen and obviously my time at the department of national defense uh, I, I've seen just how debilitating it can be, and it is a real injury, just like a physical injury. Mm-hmm. And I think anybody that has been involved in certainly a combat role, but you know, there's other forms of uh, of trauma in in the workplace and in various um, injury that we're starting to understand much better than we've ever understood before. In in the treatment and uh, and how people can rehabilitate. You did your undergrad in Acadia, and then you went to Dow for, for law school? Correct. And at that point, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do with that law degree? Absolutely. I, okay. I knew before I finished my undergrad that I wanted to do criminal law. I wanted to be in a courtroom, be a litigator, and I was very fortunate um, in the opportunities that presented in terms of pursuing that, because I, I came here to Pictou County. I set up my own law firm. And so I had, uh, I had a lot of exposure from the defense side because the youngest and the newest members of the bar are often given the majority of the cases, and I hate to say it this way, but that nobody else wants. Yeah. So you get the bulk of, of these cases, and um, many of them on what, what's called, or at least here, a legal aid certificate. So you're, you're constantly in court and you're, it's sort of the equivalent of being thrown into the deep end, you know, and there's yeah. nothing that was more instructive for me than, you know, being chewed out by a judge. That was better than anything I learned in law school in terms of it staying with you as a, as a, a lesson in the law. But I, I you know, I sort of fumbled along and, and found my feet and I, uh, I was able to, to practice here. And then something catastrophic happened that impacted my, my career. The Westray mine blew up, and it resulted in significant criminal charges against the mine managers, the company itself. And I, I knew people who were there, and it was, it was a, a really jarring experience for the community, least of all, um, for most of all, for the, the families and the workers. But as a result of that case, they took the senior crown attorneys in the central region and they put them on this file, which was a huge criminal prosecution case. And so I'd been doing what's called per diem work as a crown attorney, even though I was a defense counsel. And I was drawn more and more into the the prosecution side, working out of the local office. And eventually they took me on full time. And so you know, relatively short time, four or five years out of law school, I was prosecuting cases at a pretty high level, including one that went on appeal all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And so in terms of what I had set as a goal for myself to be in a courtroom and to practice criminal law, you know, this was the the peak of the mountain. I was doing cases every day and I was living and breathing this, this career as a prosecutor. Um, and it's what I wanted to do. So it was very fulfilling, certainly at that period of my life. Why was criminal law your focus? Why, why was that? Why were you drawn to that? That's a good question. If somebody was to sort of analyze my background, they'd say, well, your father probably was a big influence. And he was, undeniably. And he had practiced criminal law before politics. But I didn't really come to understand that until much later. I, I knew he had practiced law, but... As I came back here and talked to people, some of whom, you know, had practiced law with him, you know, some of his old law partners were still practicing law when I came back, you know, 30 years after he had. 
and some of his his colleagues and classmates were judges. So, you know, that that influence was there. But kind of after I'd made my decision, I think it had more to do with sort of a sense of social justice, uh, seeing law as a and law and politics. I'm twice blessed, but see, really seeing it as a noble profession and, you know, particularly fighting for people who, you know, were in some cases being ground up by the system and weren't represented in the courts. And then as I got more into the prosecution side, it was victims. It was people who were innocent in every sense of the word, who found themselves cast in this this role in being in a in a very unfamiliar and sometimes unforgiving system that they didn't understand. And, uh, you know, fast forward, that really was influential in the work that I did as Minister of Justice in bringing in the first Victims' Bill of Rights because I felt people were not given ample information. They weren't given notice about changes that were happening that impacted them. They were not really treated, in my view, fairly by the system itself because their rights were not protected. The Bill of Rights protects predominantly the accused, Mm -hmm. rightly so. But to counter that balance, you know, victims needed to be given a much much stronger footing in terms of their own course and journey through the justice system. Have you ever given any thought to, uh, if you didn't end up as a lawyer or you didn't end up in, in politics, what we, what you would have ended up doing was blueberry farmer ever on the uh, on the list? <laughs> well, forestry, Miller? certainly working outdoors. I I spent a very memorable summer working in northern British Columbia planting trees, but that probably put me back on the course to wanting to get <laughs> to get a, a a law degree. Do you remember whereabouts you were in? Uh, oh, BC? I w- remember well a place called New Hazelton, which was up near the Alaska border, a place uh, called Hyder, Alaska. Okay. So north of Prince George. And uh, I wouldn't say I did it on a whim because I planted a lot of trees when I was a kid just here in, in the family business. But this was a whole different, you know, this was tree planting on an industrial scale yeah. and living out in a tent and eating cold oatmeal and washing your your shorts in a, in a stream. I mean, it was, it was hardcore. I, I mean, I admire those who do that uh, year after year. Yeah, there's, there's certainly... It's important to know what you want to do, but it's also important to know what you don't want to do. Too. Yeah. And, and getting exposure to some of those things you don't want to do, you can have respect for them. But it's also good to remind you, yeah, I'm not sure that's, that's for me in the, in the long run. At what point did politics come into the equation for you? Well, you know, Chris, quite late. I mean, I was, I was launched as far as what I thought I was supposed to do in terms of a career in law. I'd taken this bit of a a diversion into the Crown Attorney's Office. And politics, quite frankly, while it was around me, was not something that I was really pursuing in any way. I was aware of it and knew the importance of politics, knew many of the players, I suppose, because of my father's career, which I followed you know, closely as you would with a parent. But I was not involved in youth politics or campus politics. I, I, uh, I say this with some hesitation. I didn't belong to a political party until I ran for a political party. And, you know, the, the political influence, as I alluded to earlier, came from probably more so my mother than my father, just because of the way, you know, I grew up kind of in a single parent home. Um, and it was a chance encounter that I had with, with Jean Charest at a convention, a provincial meeting that was happening in Halifax. And I sort of went with some of my friends almost as a lark in a way, because we were not politically active, but we, we were interested. And Charest had served with my dad, um, but he was a young guy, very dynamic, bilingual, leading the party, you know, trying to bring about a resurgence of the Conservative Party after the the meltdown in, in 1993 and the divisions that had happened, as I came to understand later. And uh, he just struck me as, a, as somebody who I, I admired and that I, you know, I was very curious as to what he was going to do. And um, 
I, I met him in Halifax, and he uh, he was very interested in what I was doing. He seemed, and he he'd started off in law as well, and wasn't you know when I look back on, he wasn't that much older than I was, although he'd had a, a pretty substantial career already in politics. And so he reached out to me and said, you know, you should do this, and we're uh, you know we're looking for good candidates, and you know, and you would be a terrific candidate, something you should consider. And I said, no, 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 I'm I'm happy what I'm doing and I, I really I appreciate it and it's very kind of you and and then you know it, it's funny how certain things happen I had already and I, and I referenced this um, struggled with the way that victims were treated by the system itself I thought the Young Offenders Act was also quite flawed in terms of the legislation itself and I was doing a lot of young offender court work at that time. Previously, it was called the Juvenile Delinquents Act, Young Offenders Act, Youth Criminal Justice Act. It had gone through several iterations. And so I started entertaining, you know, the thought of maybe getting involved. But this was, you know, this was 2000, late 2006. Um, as it turned out, there was an election in 2007. There were already declared candidates for nomination. And we're talking here about the Progressive Conservative Party. Um, which, you know, my father had been the MP here for 23 years, but there was a gap, you know, the, the seat had been won by uh, a liberal MP and or liberal candidate. And then, you know, there, there was obviously a sense of urgency to get a candidate, but there were four other people in the race. And I was working at the Crown Attorney's Office, which as I, I, I soon discovered, uh, designated me under provincial legislation as a politically restricted person. Um, but, you know, I, I went through all the proper channels. I went to the regional, local uh, sort of office manager first. Then I went to the regional office, and they all said, yeah, it's fine. It's uh, They probably thought, this guy's got no chance of winning anyway. So, yeah, let him. <laughs> it's always fine till it's not. <laughs> yeah, let him, let him go off and do this flight of fancy. And uh, so I did. I, I, you know, sort of took uh, not a leave of absence, but I did light duties and, you know, appeal work and research, and I wasn't going to court. But I just, I signed everybody up. I signed up friends and colleagues and family and uh, people I'd worked with. They, they bought membership cards in the party, and lo and behold, we had this massive nomination battle that went on, you know, the better part of a day, the day of the actual convention. And I won. Um, and it was sort of like a dog chasing a car. Well, what do I do now? Well, I didn't even have time to think about it because the, the uh, head of the public prosecution service called me into his office and fired me, basically made it a very public, you know, uh, almost like, an assassination, you know, hanging in the public square. They, he, there was a reporter there when I showed up at his office. So it was a very That public... can't have been the first moment that he realized that you were you were running for the nomination. No. Yeah. No, no, no. There yeah. was malice aforethought. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the whole idea that you would prevent somebody who is in public service already from seeking public office to me seemed very you know, counterintuitive and, and, uh, and unjust. And anyway, fast forward. Um, I mean, I had done a little bit of research myself and had already reached out to a classmate of mine who was now a lawyer and said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sue the province. You know, this is, uh, they can't take my job. I mean, there was, I had no guarantee that I was going to win. In yeah, fact, it was unlikely that I was going to win. At that point, the conservative party had two seats in the parliament of Canada. Right. Yeah. And had gotten wiped off the map, right. basically. And you've just been fired. And I'd just been fired. <laughs> and I'd never been fired from anything, from, you know, tree planting to working at a gas station as a kid. I'd, I'd never had anybody say, you're fired, especially in such a public way. And so, uh, you know, I, I went to work <laughs> in the woods working with a guy driving a, a skitter and, uh, you know, sort of trying to, unpack what had happened and getting ready for an election that we knew was coming. But, you know, when I look back on it, it was, it was probably the most, um, 
public launching pad that I could have had for public life. They were debating on the radio whether I should be fired, whether there should be restrictions on public employees. And, you know, the case took some time. And, and you know, I, I was lucky to have been elected. And then it took on, you know, it sort of put on the back burner in terms of what I was doing. I was trying to learn the ropes in Parliament and set up offices but the case eventually was on the courthouse steps, and then the province folded. And you know, that, that late in the game? Oh, yeah. years, years later. Oh, wow. Years later. And ironically, the guy who fired me was a general in the Canadian Armed Forces. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure with the... Uh, with the, the world wide web in the palm of your hands, listeners can <laughs> yeah. probably figure that out now. So you get elected. What was it like walking into the house of commons for the first time? Oh, daunting. I, I mean, I, I went from a, a local courtroom and I had, you know, appeared in other courtrooms, but it, to me, it felt like the biggest courtroom in the world to walk into that place. And, uh, in fact, I approached it like you would a courtroom. Jean Charest had asked me to be his justice critic, public safety, and, and house leader. And I didn't know what a house leader was. So I promptly went to work and learned about parliamentary procedure before the house resumed. I was really uh, blessed to have a guy named John Holtby, who was a clerk in the Ontario legislature and, and knew, you know, literally wrote the book on parliamentary procedure. And he came to work with me and um, so started to figure things out. But walking into that place was just uh, a, such an overwhelming experience. I can feel the hair on my arms popping up just thinking about it. And, you know, like many things and stages in life you you learn as you go but it was a steep learning curve and there were people there in our in our caucus and certainly people in the house of commons that had so much experience and had been there in some cases some of them had been there in my father's era and that that works both for you and against you in terms of the expectations but you know contrary to i think the impression that it is a you know, a partisan mud wrestle every day. There are some very good people in all parties who, at least in my experience, were very civil and, you know, reached out to me, would speak to me, you know, um, in ways that were extremely helpful, no matter what party they were from. And that goodwill, that, uh, that sense of we're all in this for the country, um, may have dissipated somewhat, but I, I, I hope that it's still there. I certainly have memories of a lot of people who we may have disagreed with what the solution was or what the, the direction of any particular file or even the country itself should be on. I, I felt we were there for the right reason. And, you know, most of it was based in our communities that led us to federal politics. But you very quickly see how the lines go off in so many different directions, uh, including internationally, and that we really, and this sounds trite, but we won the proverbial lottery to be in this country, either having been born here or moved here. And the parliament is is the epitome of the, the engine room that is hopefully driving the country in the right direction to make good decisions for our citizens and ensure and secure our place for the future. I think one of the the things that's um, always important for people to get a sense of is what, what is a week in the life of new MP Peter McKay look like? Because people will make a lot of assumptions, but until you've walked a mile in somebody's shoes or really have an understanding of the, the tempo and the demands uh, I think it's difficult to to really get a sense of uh, of what you know, serving as a politician um, looks like. So, what that what are those early years, uh, your typical week look like? Yeah, it's a blur because when I think back on it, uh, and people in most cases don't want to hear this, but politicians work very hard at all levels, 
and arguably in municipality, municipal politics, and, and even provincially, they're far more exposed because they're in one place and they're they're living in their community in a way that is inescapable. And if you go to the local grocery store or you're picking right. up your kids at school, now you experience that in federal politics too. But the legislature, the parliament, draws you to Ottawa. So there's that whole um, travel aspect where you're on the road and you're living in two places. Most people have an apartment or some buy a home. I, I had apartments the whole time. And so you're, you're living this dual existence. I was single. I, I didn't have kids. So I had, and, you know, again, it wasn't healthy, but I, I just went headlong into this and was spending, you know, all my waking hours learning and trying to soak it up and, uh, you know, and, and traveling this when I was back home in Nova Scotia, traveling this very large, diverse rural community. I mean, there's smaller towns like Antigonish and Glasgow and this cluster of towns here in Pictou County, but it's massive. And, and you're driving on country roads and going to little harbors. And, and I, you know, was learning more about my community than I, I ever imagined in terms of the industries that were here. And I, while I, felt that I was fairly knowledgeable about the challenges. I had no idea until you really get into sitting at somebody's kitchen table or walking through their, their, their place of employment and and hearing about these challenges. And you, you take a lot of that in you, you, you start to sort of assume that their challenges and problems are yours and that you have to do something about it. So that was, that was sort of the first real revelation is I I have to do everything I can to make things better for people in my constituency. Then the whole other aspect of the job, as you can imagine, Chris, is as a legislator. And you're reading reams of legislation and bills and learning about, you know, things that are really beyond the realm of your own experience and your own profession, but your own region and, and far afield, like what is going on in Lethbridge, Alberta, and, and what is the impact on Trois-Rivières, Quebec? And uh, that is, is also a big part of your, your indoctrination into uh, federal politics. So it was a busy, busy time, and um, I reveled in it. I, I was enjoying it. Uh, but I, you know, I think of people, especially now that I have kids of my own, people who had families that went into this environment, very, very challenging, to be sure. And many professions are. I don't, I don't mean to single politics out as the only one that offers that, that challenge. But it's, uh, it's demanding. And the, I'd say that the expectations are even higher now. And the advent of the, the Internet and the availability that is expected of your representative is uh, is punishing. It's it's relentless. It's never ending, and so people go into it. I think more with their eyes open than I did. How does mentoring work in politics? Did you have to go seek out mentors, or did people come and say, you know, hey, young fella, like let let me help you out here with with these? Can you look, think back on people who are really? instrumental in helping you, especially in those early years? It, it wasn't as pronounced as that, but you, you know, you did sort of gravitate to people and, and to experiences that would help you to figure it out. I mean, I, I had this additional role as house leader. And so I, um, there were people who I watched and, and who I ultimately was working with like Bill Blakey and originally Don Boudria in the house. Um, Don Boudry of my home writing. Yeah. 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 And so they're from other parties, but, you know, just in terms of the professionalism, how they conducted themselves, you know, when, when I got up in the House of Commons for the very first time, I referenced this earlier. I, to me, it was like being in a courtroom. And I, adju- I, I addressed the, the Speaker of the House as if he was the judge. And I, you know, I, I was very formal and, and quite rigid. And after a few weeks of this, Jean Charest pulled me aside and he said, look, I know exactly what you're doing. He said, because I did the same (laughs) thing. I'd come out of a similar background. And so he said, you know, you you have to remember, you're not just speaking to uh, 
the, the, the speaker or even the house, you're speaking to the nation. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I started contemplating that. Um, even though I guess, you know, I, I, I knew and understood that, but I mean, my way of getting through my daily, uh, exercise of, of reading up on whatever the bill was before the house and trying to herd the cats around who was speaking and, and, uh, how we would respond to the position of the government of the day. Um, I had just I hadn't given thought to just the the enormity and and the the national scrutiny that was placed on even the smallest party in the house which we were. Uh but it was thrilling. I mean Sheree was certainly one of those who I would describe now as a mentor and somebody who had you know uh, provided me with some instruction. John Holpe who I referenced in terms of just the uh the day-to-day task of of being the house leader and what that entailed. But there were other MPs from all sides of the house who uh, who I certainly got along with and uh, and worked with and learned from, and uh, you know I, it it was a much I I found it to be a much more permissive environment to learn um, than I would observe today. I think one of the, the things that people um, certainly know you know you from is when you were leader of the Progressive Conservatives and. You you were certainly one of the people instrumental in bringing different parts of the the conservative side of politics together. I mean, how what did that effort look like when you're trying to bring together um, parts of you know one part of the political movement? Yeah, <laughs> I still have the scars from that era. <laughs> it uh, you know it was kind of an interesting fight in the family that went on well before my arrival in politics. I mean, it it emanated back to the reform movement. And we talked earlier about how the party had really been broken up um, just after the maybe building up to the 1993 election where Mulroney left, Kim Campbell was leader. The Bloc Québécois had emerged uh, under different leadership, uh, Lucien Bouchard, uh, the reform movement had started in the West with Preston Manning. And the party was pulled apart at the seams, which resulted in, and, and again, not to put too fine a point on it, but a, a very uncompetitive democracy where the Conservative Party was so diluted into these different elements that they could never truly form a government. They they could win regions of mm-hmm. the country and they could elect certain members, but there were there were these runoff situations where you'd have a conservative and a reformer, and in Quebec a, a bloc member, and liberals would come up the middle with you know much less than fifty percent, sometimes as low as thirty six, thirty seven percent of the vote, and so you know without getting into all of that detail, you know I, I realized pretty quickly after arriving in Ottawa, and there was this animosity in, in the conservative movement that I was never a part of and didn't really understand. And when I got to know certain members of the Reform Party, like Monty Solberg and Chuck Strahl and John Williams and others, you know, it, it dawned on me, there's really not that much difference between you know, what they believe fundamentally, what their values are, and those of progressive conservatives and even within the progressive conservative movement throughout its history there's been different iterations i mean it was the conservative party in the very beginning it was the liberal conservative party at one point and it was the progressive conservative party when get this a agrarian based western party called the progressives joined together with the conservative party Okay. So that history was there, albeit forgotten. And so, you know, I won the leadership, yes, having campaigned to maintain the Progressive Conservative Party, as did everybody in the race. And very shortly after that, and, and prior to my election as leader, Stephen Harper had become leader of the Reform Party with the same commitment not to merge. But, you know, uh, there was a daunting uh, reality that Paul Martin, a juggernaut, as he was described, was going to roll over both parties and form the biggest majority uh, 
bigger than Mulroney's in, in, the, in the coming election. And so all of that pressure was there. So, you know, even with the conditions of having won the leadership, discussions were, were going to happen and did happen. And things accelerated. And I had people, really great people, like Bill Davis, Don Mazankowski, Lyola Hearn, and their counterparts on the other side sit down in a very quiet, controlled environment and talk it through and said, well, you know, what, what is the problem here? And what are the prospects of us continuing down this, you know, never ending path of disunity and, and ever being competitive? And so it really accelerated. And then most important part of this, when I talk about a competitive democracy, we had a referendum in both parties. Every single card carrying member of the party had a voice as to whether they, we collectively should, you know, bring things together and re I'd call it reunify the conservative movement. And that's what happened. And there, there was this timeline that we were up against and, you know, we went into the 2004 election and almost won, came close. And uh, 2006, we formed government and Stephen Harper became prime minister. So not that that eradicates everything and, and uh, you know, uh, and many people will, will still argue with, with that decision. But I'd say ultimately it, it put the conservative movement at least back in a place not only that we could form government, that we could once again talk to each other and have real dialogue and then come down on, on various policies and positions, which is kind of important for our political system to have alternatives. And, uh, and it's in keeping with the great traditions of our country. Compromise. Find a way forward. Don't, uh, don't take yourself out of play and out of competition because of one or two things that you may not be able to get a hundred percent consensus around. I think that's such an important message on real dialogue. And, uh, and one of the reasons why I like a long form podcast with people is it's far easier to dismiss somebody in their ideas when it's a soundbite, yeah. but it's a lot harder to do so when you have, I mean, what are we an hour, hour and a half talking here? And you get a real sense of someone as a person and what their motivations are uh, and how people are just trying to make the world better, as I like to say, trying to leave it better than they found it. Uh, right. And that's, I think that's why these kinds of discussions are so important, because whether or not you agree with Peter McKay, the, the politician, and the things that you want to do, I mean, you'd be very hard-pressed to spend this much time listening about somebody's life and not walk away at least say, well, I don't agree with them, but you know, I'll listen to them and we can have that real dialogue about how we should move things forward. And I think that's, that's really powerful. Well, Chris, at the risk of sounding pandering, I think that's why it's important what you're doing because it does, it fleshes out <clears throat> discussions that, as you've rightly said, can mischaracterize not only people, but even historic events or important events. And I think one of the great qualities of Canadians is that desire to understand one another. And we don't sometimes have enough platforms for people from the Arctic or Western Canada to talk to people from, you know, Quebec or Ontario or the East. I, I still kind of bristle when I hear people out West saying, you know, oh, we're so mad at the East. And I think, what are we doing? <laughs> but they're not talking about Atlantic no, Canada. No, they're not talking about Atlantic They're Canada. talking about anybody East. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wish we had an exchange program within Canada that would allow young people to have more, more access to one another. But I, I think technology and what you're doing is, is part of that and is, uh, is an enabler for understanding. And Canadians, I think, really desire that. They, uh, it, it's one of the great qualities, I think, characteristics of our country is that, that willingness and openness and, and spirit of wanting to really understand um, what other people are going through and, and how we band together. We need more national initiatives. Life changed for you when you formed government. Oh, 
Well, again, it, it's sort of, uh, it's like stepping, you know, from a, an escalator onto a rocket. You know, you're already <laughs> going in a direction where you're not exactly sure, uh, you know, where you're going to wind up. But then going into government, and, and there was a buildup to that. So we, we almost won in, in 2004 after the unification of the, the conservative movement. And then 2006, um, we won the election, a minority government. Um, I'll never forget getting a call from the prime minister, you know, come and see him at Harrington Lake. I go there. I didn't have any particular expectation, although I was hopeful that this meant I was going to be in the cabinet of Stephen Harper. And uh, he asked me ultimately to be his foreign minister. And then almost as an afterthought, as I was leaving, got up to leave, he said, oh, you're, you're going to be the ECOA minister and the minister responsible for Nova Scotia and PEI, which, you know, I later became a much bigger and more substantive role than I, I appreciated at the time, in addition to being foreign minister. So it, it again, was an acceleration of activity and, uh, and, and workload, and, but it, it was... It was thrilling. I mean, it was absolutely uh, a massive honor to be in that role. I, I remember walking into the Pearson building on Sussex after being sworn into cabinet, which again, all seemed surreal being at Rideau Hall, you know, being sworn into the cabinet. Um, my parents were there and, and it was a, it was a really, uh, incredible experience, but going to the Pearson building and being greeted by officials, my deputy minister, and then literally walking into this corner office that overlooks Rideau and, and, uh, the British embassy and somebody, I, I can't remember who comes into the office and said, uh, U S secretary of defense on line one, <laughs> like this is minutes after assuming the role yeah, three, two, one rocket ship. Yeah. Fire. No briefing, no background, nothing. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, he was Condoleezza Rice who I, I became good friends with over time. And, uh, you know, it, that began a, a very, uh, uh, hectic and, and demanding time as, as you would expect in a portfolio like that. I, ironically in the context of the current, war between Israel and Hamas, um, literally weeks after assuming that role, we were facing, probably months, uh, we were facing the evacuation of Canadians out of Lebanon. Yeah, I remember that. 2006. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, was really my first true collaboration with members of the Canadian Armed Forces on such a file. How long did you stay in that ministerial role? I can't remember. It was about 18 months. Okay. Yeah. And how did the the change to Minister of National Defense come about? Is that a sort of a very because again it's you know I think listeners probably have their own view of how this may or may not happen. They form in their mind: is it a very deliberate thing, or is it a pick up the phone? Hey, by the way, Peter, um, new job for you. You know, we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> how do these things come about? Well, something in between. Okay. Uh, I. Uh, I didn't see it coming, although perhaps I should have. And, and I, I would like to say that it had less to do with me than, than sort of the need to make some changes within the cabinet. And there's a there's sort of a knock on effect. It's like pick up sticks. You pull one out and there's there's other consequence. So um, as luck would have it, the prime minister was here in Nova Scotia and we were attending an event together and he, he sort of pulled me aside and said, look, we have to make some changes and, and, uh, I would like you to go to defense, the department of national defense. It was really that direct. And, you know, I, I was sort of surprised to hear this, but at the same time and looking back on it, there were other dynamics at play and, you know, professionally, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Although I didn't feel that way at the time. I, I loved the work that I was doing. I felt I was just really, after 18 months, starting to really get into the files. There were a lot of, you know, again, massive issues and uh, work that was being done by the department internationally. I, I mean, it was it was stunning how impactful 
uh, Canada was, in my view, and and can be. And so, it's a it's a pretty uh, overwhelming feeling to be Canada's representative to the world. Now, our embassies around the world, uh, we have a we have a very large public service dedicated to that task. But you're the point person. And, um, you know, thorny issues, you're, you're under massive scrutiny when you're outside the country as well as in. But the Depart- Department of National Defense, you know, by this time, 2008, uh, we are really in the thick of it in Afghanistan. And that became, you know, my primary focus was how we were prosecuting that war and overseeing the just incredibly important efforts that were being undertaken by the department in conjunction with foreign affairs, international development, and and everything that that conflict entailed. And we were losing people. You know, we were taking combat casualties for the first time probably since Korea, although there had been casualties in Bosnia and and other... other, uh, peacekeeping missions, as they were called at that time. But this was a, this was different. This had a a very different feel for the country, certainly for the armed forces. And, you know, I think it's not that insightful to say that we did not know what we were in for when we signed up to send troops into, especially into Kandahar province. Was your entire tenure as the Minister of National Defense um, within the bounds of the, the Afghan war? Yes. In its entirety, from 08, late 07, 08, to when I left in 2013, although we had started to draw down at that time. Have you reflected upon that at all? That, I mean, I can't imagine that there's too many other ministers of national defense since Korea that have been in the situation that you were in. Barney Danson was a, I read, read a fair bit about him. Uh, he was a, a minister that was in the portfolio for about the same time, almost six years. Um, during yeah. Korea? No, during the Second World War. Oh, okay. And, and was a veteran himself. So would have obviously had a much different frame of reference having served, which I, you know, in retrospect, wish I had. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I, I reflected on it a lot, probably more so since I left politics, because I went from defense into justice and attorney general, which is also a very big, all-encompassing department on a, on a different level. But I had a much, you know, I, I had a career in law and I, I had worked in the profession, whereas coming into the Department of National Defense, I had a very steep hill to climb. But I had great support and tremendous people to work with. My first chief of defense staff was Rick Hillier, you know, followed by Walt Matinchuk and Tom Lawson. And so we, uh, you know, we we were in a, a very urgent situation, to say the least, in terms of the equipment needs, the training um, that was well underway at that time in terms of the, the type of warfare, asymmetrical warfare in a, a desert, remote country that was far away. So stresses on the supply chain, multinational mission. I think by the end, there were 65 different countries involved, not all, obviously, you know, more than just the NATO countries. And a just relentless conflict that was well outside the boundaries of anything I think the Canadian forces had seen before in terms of the the type of, uh, you know, terrorist guerrilla warfare that played by no rules whatsoever. A lot of of the early casualties, of course, in that conflict were around IEDs, you know, roadside bombs, ambushes, rockets that came in you know, from unknown places. It was, it was really, really uh, a shocking experience, I think, for most who were there uh, in terms of what their training would have prepared them for. All ministers feel a sense of personal responsibility for the portfolio that they, that they have. How is it different in 
your experience between you know, being in defense, but then being in defense uh, your entirety of your time uh, during the during that war? Well, you know, I, I had been in the Department of Foreign Affairs previously, so was fairly well versed in some of what I, I would later encounter at uh, at the Department of National Defense, just in terms of knowing the trajectory of that conflict from, you know, going back really to 9-11 and, uh, and how things had evolved. And I, I had, uh, again, very professional, capable public servants, deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers that were feeding me information and, and preparing me for international meetings that I attended, whether they be at NATO, VET and G8 discussions. <clears throat> but to come back to your question, standing at a ramp ceremony or a repatriation um, is nothing that I think any minister is prepared for. Dealing with grieving families, dealing with the, the aftermath and the reality of Canadian citizens, soldiers being killed in action. As I said before, we, we had not seen that kind of sacrifice. And it was jarring for the nation. I think it was a, an awakening for particularly a generation who had no real point of reference outside a history book to see a flag draped coffin coming off the back of a plane at Trenton Air Force Base. That was a very, very um, pivotal moment in our country's history. And from that grew this highway of heroes phenomenon. Um, more substantially, the department itself had to grapple with the support that was necessary. That frankly, you know, again, I referenced my grandfather. There, there wasn't people waiting and embracing and helping and supporting those who were coming back from war. And so a lot of that had to be stood up. And I, I credit my predecessor, Gordon O'Connor, who was a soldier. In fact, he was a, you know, he was a compatriot of Rick Hillier's. And, you know, these joint personal support units, the, the family um, supports were, were still nascent, but being put in place. And uh, that took resources, but more importantly, it took really compassionate, dedicated people, not all of them in the Department of Defense, because there was sort of a wraparound realization that we, you know, we have to do more than just provide accommodations and pensions and, and a little bit of support. And I, I think Rick Hillier probably defined that recognition of the family as being the strength behind the uniform and, uh, and really shone a light on those efforts. Red Fridays, and uh, just that the the public, as I say, I think the better best word is awakening that was happening across the country. Sadly, looking back on it, it uh, didn't last. It dissipated quickly. I think a lot of people who have been in leadership positions, uh, especially at at higher levels probably feel a, a real sense of is isolation or loneliness sometimes, especially when grappling with some of these issues. I mean, how, how when you're the minister, uh, do you get that support you need when you're, you know, you're one of one and, and you're at the you know, top of the department? Well, I mean, I didn't, I, I never saw this as being about me. I saw this as being this very heavy, responsibility to get things done. I mean, I felt the truly unrelenting pressure of delivering for people who I had enormous respect for and, and knew were not only deserving, but in need of equipment and in need of action. And so whether that was arguing for certain Changes perhaps in policy, um, being at the NATO table and trying to really bring about other countries' recognition of the weight that Canada was carrying in Kandahar province, which was the spiritual home of the Taliban and where much of the intense fighting was happening because of its proximity uh, 
to the Pakistan border where Taliban were flowing freely in and out. And back home, it was, yes, to some degree, rallying support and informing Canadians, informing Parliament, going to committees and answering questions about the mission, ably assisted by the department, both the civilian and the uniform side. But it was also getting equipment. I mean, I think all of the CDSs I dealt with really impressed upon me the need for things like heavy armor. We needed to get better vehicles for traveling the roads like Hyena Road and, you know, being in these really dangerous exposed situations around Kandahar. And so that that meant wheeled vehicles, uh, LAVs, ultimately tanks, uh, heavy guns to sort of hit spots and be able to keep Taliban at bay, and even things as basic as the, you know, the body armor uniforms that they needed in theater, and and everything else that went with that, plus coordinating with our closest allies, the Americans and the Brits in particular, the Aussies in some cases. So there was a lot going on, Chris, in that period for for everybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, it it was also, you know, very motivating uh, and dealing on a personal level, as you said, with people who are taking on this historic task, which was liberating the people of Afghanistan. I mean, it's easy to lose sight of why we were there. I mean, I got asked all the time in question period by reporters, why are we there? And I I thought a lot about that both then and, and now. And if I had to say one thing, you know, as opposed to a long rambling answer, like some of these answers, I would say, so little girls could go to school. You know, if there, if there was one part of that mission that is easy to overlook. I mean, we were building schools so that kids, in some cases who hadn't been in school, girls, for 10 years, could get an education, which would be transformative for the country. And we set up, you know, the the security around those schools, which was necessary. We try, of course, ferociously to train the Afghan people, their security forces, to do for them what we were doing and these operational mentoring liaison teams, omelets, military love acronyms, <laughs> TLAs, three-letter acronyms. Can't get enough of them. Um, and so it, it, it just it entailed everything and more that I had ever imagined went on within the, the Department of National Defense while on a mission as complicated as that one was. Plus all of the domestic operations, the training. We had uh, that horrible earthquake in Haiti happened in the midst of that and, and were called upon to, to respond and support. And we were doing other ongoing missions. In addition, I think there were some 30, roughly 30 different missions that we were on in addition to Afghanistan, which seems unthinkable today. Mm. You know, ships at sea, supplies, yeah, training absolutely. with other countries. Smaller missions that may only have a couple of people, but yes. they still need they still need care and feeding and attention. Plus, big challenges here at home. Uh, I mean, in terms of housing, in terms of the, the yeah. supports. I mean, and those those issues, let's call them, have not gone away, and uh, in fact, have arguably become much more challenging. Why did you decide to to exit federal politics? What were the conditions by which you said, uh, I need to go do something else or I want to go do something else? Well, it's a good question. I think for everybody it's personal, and uh, we spoke about timing, timing to get in, timing to get out. I'd been doing it for 18 years. I had recently been married. My wife Nazanin and I had a, a child. Um, she was expecting again. Um, I haven't shared really much of this, but my mother was diagnosed with cancer at that time and was very sick. Um, and it, it had weighed on my mind that, you know, I I, I thought it, it just seemed like everything was aligning for uh, a change, you know, a change in career, a change that would allow me to focus more on a family, which... I don't think I consciously delayed having a family, but that was ultimately the result of being 
all in and a workaholic and just being driven to do everything I could do while I was in politics. Um, and there was one day, ironically, that sort of stands out in that time of deliberation where my son, who was couldn't have been much more than two years old, had figured out that in order for him to see me, he had to insert himself, and, and he did so in a very clever way. I would come home late at night, and I often had briefings that I had to go over or things I had to read, and, and I'd bring home these briefing books, and I'd put them all in this big briefcase and leave them by the door so that when I went out in the morning, it was right there, and I'd just grab my briefcase and go out the door. And, he, and so I was leaving early, coming home late, and uh, you know, then I would have time sometimes on the weekends. And we were still traveling back and forth, just as an aside. I mean, he had an arrow miles. <laughs> Card <laughs> where he had accumulated more air miles than, than any two year old, I think. Um, but the point of the story was this particular morning I got up early, you know, was going out the door before six, and he was sitting on that briefcase. And that was sort of the day that I said, okay, I, I got to make a change here. This is, uh, this is affecting him in a, in a way that two-year-old shouldn't have to deal with that. We've spoken about, uh, about this sort of off, offline, about transition, about leaving something that you are all in uh, into something else. And how did you, how does that work from, or how did that work for you? How did you manage the transition from something that you had been running hard at for so many years uh, into the next thing? Well, it, it is a transition, to be sure, as, as in any career, as in any major life decision when you've been doing something for a while. And, and, you know, I think as human beings, we tend to sort of set up structures that help us to, to cope with the daily challenges. I've been traveling so much, you know, and, and I think the change of being a husband, being a father lent itself even before I left to starting that transition. And I would call it reprioritizing in very basic terms, what was important. And so, you know, came home, um, the election happened around November, as I recall, or October. And, um, I, I needed a job, you know, my, my <laughs> wife was having a, our second child and how does that as a resume look unemployed yeah minister of justice minister of national defense minister of foreign affairs yeah well it's not a, as uh, as attractive as you might think <laughs> um but i i was lucky i i you know had people who'd reached out to me and uh i knew i i should have said earlier i knew i wanted to go back to the law i wanted to practice law again i wanted to return to that career which i had sort of interrupted by going into politics. Little did I know it would be an 18-year interruption. And so I, I was fortunate. I looked at a couple of different firms, but I decided that for my family at that point, um, going to a big firm in Toronto, something I never would have imagined doing, you know, prior to the experience of politics. I, it just was not interesting to me to be on Bay Street I mean, every, most of my classmates went through the the interview process. Not most, but a good number. And I I just wanted to be a small town criminal lawyer and pursue that. And uh, so I, I I went to Toronto with Baker McKenzie, and they were a massive international firm. Met some great people. It was eye opening in in ways that were different from politics, but also exciting and, and interesting to me. And so I did that for, well, for five years. And then, then politics came calling again. And, uh, you know, it uh, didn't go as planned. But ultimately, that decision led me to be back in Nova Scotia and, uh, and doing what I consider to be really interesting work with Deloitte and with another law firm here, uh, McGinnis Cooper, and uh, I, I feel, again, blessed th that uh, I've had these different experiences. Our, our third child, 
Caledon was born while I was in Toronto, while Nazanin and I were there with uh, with the other two kids. And that was a, a, another gift from God to, to have that little boy come into our life. Um, but I, I wanted to raise my kids here and to have them at least experience some of what I'd experienced growing up in rural Nova Scotia. And so that has also played itself out uh, in ways that, you know, I, I couldn't have imagined. It's been wonderful. When you decided to dip your toe back into the political waters, how is that experience different from sort of 20, almost 25 years earlier? You enter politics, the digital age hasn't really hit us. And then... I didn't carry a cell phone when I first got involved in politics. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great reference point. So you don't have a cell phone. You're from rural Nova Scotia. Uh, and now you're going to... What year were you getting back into it? Uh, 20, 2019, 2020. Yeah. So how, how is that, how is it, how does it evolve with the way the digital age and the information age has evolved? Well, it was, it was complicated further by COVID, which hit right in the middle of it. Yeah, um, right. Of course. I mean, I, I would go back though to what had happened in not only in my political career, but personally, I mean, meeting Nazanin was the classic game changer for me. Uh, and that was like a bolt of lightning, you know, in terms of the impact that that had on on me personally and the decisions that I made. I just wanted to spend as much time as I could with her and and then after marriage with our kids. And so it it, it really was like a reboot of my brain in, in many ways. And then going back to law. So we had a very long discussion about what that would look like if I was to go back to politics. And, and, you know, Nazanin's been enormously influential on a a whole bunch of things, including, you know, certain decisions in politics, but, you know, on on the impact that it has on on us versus the country, you know, and some of these big issues. And she's, she's very active in many ways then and now in trying to primarily to focus on on children, what's happening back in Iran. She started an organization called Stop Child Execution. How's that for a a jarring pursuit? Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't just, you know, what was happening in Iran. It's happening in China, Venezuela, places where they they still execute minors. And that was how we met. Um, I became aware of her work when I was at Foreign Affairs. But she was living in Vancouver. I was living in... Nova Scotia. We were both involved with other people at that time. It was a very sort of initial professional meeting around what Canada could do to support these humanitarian efforts in many countries. And, and, um, you know, then she, she ultimately moved to Ottawa and was still doing this, this work. I was now at the department of national defense and there were several conferences that I attended where, she had provided information about those countries and what Canada could be doing, should be doing. And, and then it evolved from there. But we, um, we were living in Toronto to come back to this point and looking at what was happening, uh, in, in the country internationally. And I think we both were of the view that politics is a very effective way to affect change in simple terms. And that um, the thought was that I still had a bit of that uh, gas in my tank and desire to, to, to be involved in, in public service. And, and it went from there. I, and I, you know, I had obviously a lot of people that I had discussed this with and the party itself was struggling a little bit at that time. They'd lost the previous two elections and, uh, I still had a lot of friends and colleagues who were still in politics who were encouraging me to come back. So when you decided to get back into it, how how had the world of politics changed even in that short amount of time? Had it changed? Um, Had this sort of information age made it a a bit of a different animal? In my experience, yes. It it was much, um, much influenced by online activity. Campaigning was done online. Your your announcements, pronouncements, policy was broadcast, uh, you know, via via the internet. 
Um, and then that was even further accelerated, some would say exacerbated by the arrival of COVID. You know, in terms of how we ran our campaign, we had to completely pivot away from public appearances. You couldn't make public appearances. That was something I hadn't anticipated when we started yeah, of course not. on the route back uh, to potential leadership. And it, it was also, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this, but it was also like a meaner, leaner experience than I had recalled. And that was just within within the party. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. I think uh, tons of people have observed that that folks will say things, say things online that they would never say to someone face-to-face. They yeah, I action. think that's true. Yeah, they take actions in, in the digital world that they would never do in the physical world to somebody. It, it seems, that seems to be the case, for sure. People feel um, emboldened to be behind a screen and not interacting with somebody or looking them in the eye while they're making all kinds of accusations and recriminations. And um, I don't think that's a good thing in politics, but it's not a good thing generally uh, that society has evolved into that type of exchange. And I think it's very toxic for kids. And, you know, we've seen this spike, not to go down this rabbit hole, but we've seen this spike in online bullying. It was something that I had seen really starting in its genesis before I'd left the Department of Justice. We'd we'd passed certain legislation around the unlawful distribution of intimate images, which were happening, you know, everywhere. There was a very, very tragic case in this province involving a young woman named Retea Parsons. And there was others, Amanda Todd in British Columbia and, and all places in between and internationally where kids were being bullied to the point where they took their own lives. And um, so we, we were trying, we were grappling with how we could legislate and empower police and interventions to stop this. But I, I dare say that that challenge is still there and uh, it's become prolific and you know we could talk at length about what a dark place the internet can be we started talking about that and uh, you know the proliferation of human trafficking and uh, illicit activity that is is a very very disturbing um, aspect of this information age And, you know, I, with kids and, and you have a daughter, it's, uh, it's a particularly complicated um, discussion to have with kids when they're at a young age because they, they, don't, they don't really appreciate the jeopardy that they could be in, and, and sadly, until it's too late. No, you're, you're right. They, they don't. And it, is, uh, it is definitely another one of the complexities of parenting, without a, without yeah. a doubt, in addition to, you know, your family and, you know, the, the focus you have on, on them. I mean, how, how are you spending your time these days? How do you, are you, how are you continuing to serve? What's important to you professionally now? Yeah. Well, in, in addition to work, which is pretty demanding, um, and, and the time that I'm spending with my kids, I, I, uh, and I coach, I volunteer, you know, with, uh, with my son's hockey team and support local causes here first and foremost in this province and in this community. But I was involved for a good part of my life with Special Olympics because of a, a family member, a cousin, my first cousin, who uh, was involved in that organization. I became aware of it very young. My mother was actually involved to some degree. And uh, in university, I, I was a big brother through the Big Brothers, Big Sisters program. That's another organization that I have tried to support throughout uh, much of my life. And, you know, other callings uh, and boards, volunteer boards that I've been on that are important causes. One is a illicit finance, uh, which is work-related, as it turns out, but it's, uh, it's another international organization that I support that is attempting to set up an international anti-corruption court, sort of modeled on The Hague uh, for for other criminal acts. 
Um, and you know, I, I support my wife, which is a form of, of, uh, I, I suppose vicarious volunteerism. She's, she's still very, very active in terms of helping, um, women and girls around the world, but predominantly in Iran at this point. Uh, and, and those are, those are important, really important callings, I think, to try to give back and to try to, uh, help organizations that are, are doing great work and, uh, you know, supplementing people's lives. I try to, my kids would say indoctrinate them, but make them aware of, of people who are less fortunate, people who are struggling. You know, we go by the food bank and we uh, go by the SBCA and they've, they've seen it. They're sensitive kids. They, uh, they, they get it. And, and I think smaller communities in some ways make it personal because they, they know their classmates and they yeah. know, you know, people that they see on the street. I've never seen more homeless people as I have in the last couple of years. And, you know, when we were in Toronto, it was, it was more prevalent, but I, I don't recall seeing that growing up in a community like ours, tent cities, big lineups at food banks. It's uh it, it's a very, very pernicious, um, development for a lot of a lot of communities across the country and obviously when you're watching the nightly news what's going on in ukraine what's happening now in, in israel and in the middle east and and taiwan i was in taiwan just over a year ago okay and uh that's a whole other daunting very daunting prospect of uh, of china going into the island of taiwan You've been writing some uh, some op eds uh, recently on uh, a lot of focus on national security. Um, can you maybe give a listener a, a sense of you know some of the things that are sort of top of your list, your biggest concerns. I mean, a bit of a segue there, mentioning Taiwan, but uh, if they haven't necessarily seen your uh, some of your writings as of late. Well, you know, at the risk of sounding alarmist, uh, I don't think I. In my lifetime, in our lifetime, Chris, have seen a more volatile geopolitical situation than we're experiencing right now. I stood up or was part of a group that stood up the Halifax International Security Forum back around 2008 to try to bring that discussion to the forefront in our country by inviting defense and security experts to come to Canada, to Halifax, and make us more prevalent in in the discussion and and bring a uniquely canadian perspective and and solutions frankly which we're good at we have very skilled diplom- diplomats and and uh, canadian forces members and and public servants generally that i think add a lot to the discussion but Bringing public awareness also brings the requisite impetus for government, resources that are brought to bear, whether it be equipment, whether it be foreign aid, whether it be aid for Canadians. And so, you know, at its core, politics is people, politics is conversations, policy, moving in a direction with the greatest degree of consensus that you can achieve. And you can't get any of that without getting people in a room and like molecules bouncing off one another and hopefully trying to find to the degree that it's possible a a way forward. And so I, I still take a lot of um, time to sometimes put what I hope are thoughtful and maybe helpful thoughts to paper and, uh, I say paper, it's it's all online now, but just as an aside, I'm laughing because we were sitting down the other day with our kids teaching them handwriting, which they don't teach in schools. Cursive. I mean, cursive writing. Yeah. It's incredible. But, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy writing. I always did. I just didn't have time for it. Um, like, I, I enjoy drawing and, and reading, um, but it's it's hard to find the time now, late at night or early mornings, and and all of the hours are full, but it's... I feel it's incumbent upon people that have had, you know, really fortunate and and, uh, incredible experiences to to share that. And so I try to do it when I can. 
When you run up against an issue that's important to you, whether it be personally or it's important to the party, but maybe it's not something that is uh, at the forefront of Canadians' minds. And I think defense and security is a good example. We generally live in a pretty peaceful, physical, peaceful nation, I think means that most Canadians don't really think about that very often. They think about the things that are in front of them every day. And unfortunately, with the digital age, we're now dealing with things like disinformation, cyber, space, uh, foreign interference, uh, a a whole bunch of things. So how, in your experience, uh, do you you get Canadians to, I don't want to say understand, because I think that has a bit of a pejorative sense, but you get them engaged or maybe interested or wanting to ask another question or wanting to look a little bit more into an issue that really, on the surface, that doesn't seem to affect them. Well, I mean, that's a very, let's just unpack some of that. It's, um, it's not that Canadians are not informed, and I know you're not implying that. It's that they're distracted. Mm-hmm. You know, this is an age of anxiety, but it's also an age of intense concern over your future, your your kid's future, you know, your loved ones. It, it, it's an uncertain time economically. You know, any, any glimpse of the nightly news brings a, a very foreboding feeling of insecurity. And so... You know, you're almost asking people to go to a very deep, dark place when they're worried about making their mortgage payment or can they afford medication or, you know, paying for groceries, getting your oil tank filled up. Uh, the, these are the, the, the pressing daily priorities. You know, we're talking in the Maritimes and you said, get your oil tank filled up. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Well, but a lot of folks, obviously, as much as they would like to be green and off the grid, that's they can't re- do it. They can't. still the reality in parts it's of the country. It's still reality. Yeah. yeah, we're burning bunker sea oil and coal out here. And for our small population, we're amongst the highest greenhouse gas uh, uh, emitters. I- anyway, to come back to the question... I think it is very incumbent upon leaders, elected officials at all levels, um, to bring some grounding about what's happening elsewhere and how that impacts us. Example, I hear very few people talk about, and this ties in a number of subjects, but I hear very few people talk about the changes that are happening in the Arctic, which are a huge part of our country, not only geographically, but in terms of the vulnerability, in terms of the people who are there, the long-term impacts that 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 could entail and will entail if we're not careful. You know, yes, it's about sovereignty. It's about our obligation to our own citizens. But there are some very dark forces pressing up against us there. The Russians. You saw what's happening in Ukraine, previously Crimea, which was part of Ukraine. They're building, rebuilding and and recapitalizing their military bases. They're putting missiles there. They're building landing strips. Why? You know, the same reason the Chinese uh, regime have built aircraft carriers and icebreakers. There's no ice in Beijing Harbor. Again, not to be foreboding, but... We have to be grounded in reality about what's happening. These are very real and present dangers and threats if we're not careful. And it's why, not to oversimplify it, we need to have robust military. We need to invest in defensive, if nothing, capabilities. You know, there there used to be something called the dew line, which you'll remember, which is of a bygone era. But, you know, early warning systems... um, collaboration through NORAD, which very few people know about, you know, our communications security establishment, again, really important for monitoring threats. You know, we had this spectacle of a so-called Chinese weather balloon drifting across our skies. I mean, those are telltale signs of our readiness or lack thereof. And so... You know, back to the the reference of why write articles or why give interviews, I I just would hope, and I'm certainly not the only one to do it, and I'm not the best at doing it, but I think 
we need to have those discussions because people are, are, it's not because they don't want to pay attention or that they don't have the bandwidth to do it. Maybe they don't, but there's so much else happening in their daily lives that it's very hard to, to get them to focus on something, as you said, that is seemingly remote and far off and not really the wolf at our doorstep, to use that expression. But I, and, and I, I know you do as well, um, are seized of information that make it more daunting and, and more proximate to our daily lives. We don't live in splendid isolation on the northern half of the North American continent. You know, the world is closing in on us. And part of that is just simply the the opening of Arctic waters because of, of global warming, the, the change in, in the dynamics of relationships, you know, what Russia and China, North Korea and other countries are doing, what their ambitions are, our, you know, diplomatic successes, but also our failures in terms of how we manage those relationships. You know, it, it's, a, it's a giant... And, uh, and, and rapidly changing environment out there that uh, we cannot, as the saying goes, you, you can be on the right track, but if you're not moving, you can get run over. Uh, and, and it feels a little bit like we're not moving fast enough to ultimately prepare for what may come. I, uh, I did a, a podcast with a... Uh a gentleman who uh, is an Afghan living in Toronto named Shwai Brahim. Fascinating story. And he said something I thought was really important. He said, you know, this, this thing we have in Canada is wonderful, but it's fragile. Yeah. He said, just like a pane of glass. He said, when it breaks, trying to put it back together is exceedingly difficult. So you want to do everything you can to make sure that you, you make that uh, as anti-fragile, uh, as robust as possible, because putting the pieces back together afterwards is far more difficult than avoiding the breakage in the first place. Well, and that's very prescient, and I suspect that that Afghan gentleman, you know, having grown up in Afghanistan and lived through, if if he's you know roughly our age, the invasion of the Russians in the eighties, the external pressures from Pakistan to Iran. And the more recent conflict and return of the Taliban, he would have a much, much greater appreciation of what life could be uh, living under a totalitarian regime or having seen your country invaded and being at war. And that seems unthinkable. But there are people, veterans, very few of them now, most centurions, who went off to war as young people. And the history books, you know, uh, are sometimes forgotten. I think there are a lot of lessons of history that we are in danger of, of forgetting, or at least not heeding to the extent that we, we should. And it, it, it is very, very personal. I, I just, you know, had a flashback memory of being at a school in Afghanistan, where some of these girls that I spoke of earlier, who we were trying to help provide an education system, and, you know, they many of them hadn't been in school for a decade, and they were, you know, 15 years old. And this one little girl, who was, you know, a little older than my, my daughter, and just was stunning. She had these effervescent green eyes, and, and all of the girls were so excited that we were there that day visiting because they wanted to showcase, you know, clearly their teachers or principal had told them, you know, these are the Canadians who, you know, made this school possible. And, and so they wanted to show what they were learning and, and the, the classroom environment was just, you know, vibrating with excitement. And this little girl through a translator told me, I, I said, what, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do with your education? She said, I want to be a teacher. <laughs> She said, I go back to my little village every day, and I, I get emotional thinking about it. She said, I teach the other kids what I learned that day. And some of them were taking two and three 
years of, of a curriculum in a single year. Like they were just so intensely focused on, on bettering themselves. They, it was like they'd been in the, I don't to say they'd been in the desert. They were so thirsty for knowledge. Mm-hmm. They, they wanted to just soak it all up. And, and, um, I remember thinking when I saw everything collapsing and, and the evacuation out of Kabul, like, where's that little girl? Her name was Anastasia. And, uh, just think of all of those kids and that's what's at stake. You know, that not to be melodramatic about it, but those are the things that can happen when civility completely departs. Peter, it's been really generous of you and uh, Nazanin to have me into your beautiful home here in Nova Scotia. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Northern Sentinels podcast. And one of the things that I always close with is asking if you have any recommendations to the listener uh, that will uh, educate entertain or elevate so what do you have for us well chris firstly thank you for uh, having me on this podcast uh, appropriately named uh, northern sentinels which i think is a a great uh, sort of symbol of our country in response to your question i would say travel get to know your country first i mean i i think there's this romantic notion that a lot of young Canadians have that they have to go to Europe or they have to visit uh, far off and exotic places. And that's fine. And that's, that's a wonderful education, but there's so much to see and know about our great country. And, uh, that's, I mean, I, I had the good fortune, I referenced tree planting in Northern, uh, Northern uh, British Columbia. I worked uh, at, at a lodge in Alberta, you know, and uh, got to know a lot of people through various travels and exchanges. I, I went to Chicoutimi to study French uh, between law school. And I, I just think, again, I, I wish there were more venues and, and ability to encourage that internal learning of, uh, of what a what our country has to offer and just being informed. I, I think, uh, you know, I sometimes speak still to university kids and, and not kids, young adults and students. And I say, you know, if you don't go to the dance, don't complain about the music, which kind of encapsulates, like, don't be a bystander, be a participant, go to the dance, you know, play the music, be the music, change the music. It's really about, our democracy and you have to be an active participant that is the essential ingredient of building a country and making the country what you want it to be and and meeting its potential everybody has a role to play in that fantastic thanks again really appreciate your time peter my pleasure chris You can find information in the show notes on the West Ray Mine Disaster, Peter's firing as a Crown Prosecutor, the Unite the Right Initiative, his various ministerial portfolios, and some of his recent op-eds. Thanks for listening to the NSP, and goodbye until next time.